definitely focus on demand, supply and demand issues. When something seems very busy, there's tremendous opportunity to elevate your price so long as you're delivering value in the marketplace. The caveat being that you don't want to get into an overcharging or ripoff strategy, but if the customer acknowledges that the value exists and they're willing to pay for it, then don't hold back. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts, plus 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the tasty relationship between them. I'm Mark Stivig. Today, our guest is Michael Hurwitz. And here are three things you want to know about Michael before we start. He has been running a pricing consulting firm, SPMG, since 2001, almost forever. Uh, Before that, he even had a, a stint in a management consulting firm, Deloitte. And you may not believe this, but Michael is the guy who wrote the book, the joy of pricing. Welcome, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's good to be here. Thank you very much. And I, I just want to remind the audience that uh, we are roughly equal in age. So I uh, just want to let everyone know that uh, we, we share the same tenure in the pricing world or close to it. I, I'm glad that you think you're as old as I am. That's really not. <laughs> <laughs> So Michael and I are actually friends. We talk quite often and, uh, and it's lovely when I get a chance to, to have a friend on the podcast because that means we're going to be a little more jovial than usual. And, and Michael said he wanted to be on the podcast today and he said, let's talk about pizza. And I, and I said, what, you, you buy a pizza shop or something? And he's like, no, let's just talk about pricing pizza. So Michael, let's talk about pricing pizza. Sure, Mark. I mean, who doesn't love pizza at the end of the day? I, pizza and hamburgers are the two most single most popular foods in the United States and probably around the world. Anywhere you go, there's someone having a slice of pizza. They're ordering a pizza for a sporting event or some high profile event. It's delivered to your door. You can drive through and pick up a pizza slice and you can walk in uh, or dine in and have a pizza. So uh The reason I wanted to talk with you today, Mark, about pizza is uh, I find that um, you can, it's analogous with almost any business in the real world. You can, you can find commonality in terms of how pizza is or is supposed to be priced. And there are some common pricing strategies and tactics uh, that resonate within the the whole concept of pizza as you would in a, in big business. Yeah. And so it's, I would say that it's fair to say that pricing almost anything, there are so many things that are common or similar about it. And so it makes a ton of sense to talk about something that we all know and enjoy and love and and can imagine and understand. Uh, But before we get into pricing pizza, I got to ask, now I grew up in the Midwest and, and in the Midwest, we ate pepperoni pizza, like that's the one. And then I moved to Chicago for a year. And in the whole Chicago area, everybody eats sausage pizza. Nobody eats pepperoni pizza. You live in Toronto. What do they eat there? Well, it's usually a combination between, and, and we're not alien up here in Toronto. So uh, the tendency is to, is to go for the, uh, either the, uh, your margarita pizza, your, your, your cheese pizza, or your, uh, or your pepperoni pizza. Canadians, by, uh, by their very nature, are quite conservative uh, folk individuals, and um, they tend to choose the, the, the bare basics. Having said that, over the years, I think uh, Toronto has uh, emulated and, and found itself to be more of an upscale city, or at least they're trying to be. And, and there's all kinds of varieties of pizzas now, you know, that are uh, including stuffed pizza and, and gourmet pizzas, flat pizzas, deep dish pizza like Chicago. Um, the variety is endless, of course, but uh, uh, yes. so my is- favorite is my favorite is when you coat it with meat, right? As much meat as you could possibly get onto a pizza. And in fact, here's a hint for all my listeners, because I love lots of pepperoni. If I'm going to have a pepperoni pizza, I've now started ordering my pepperoni pizzas as I want double, triple. I don't care. I just don't want to see a spot where there isn't a pepperoni. And oh my God, that comes out so good. Well, <laughs> What's your you favorite, know- Michael? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, Mark, um, you're no different. And th this is the very reason why I want to talk about pizza today, because the traditional model of pricing pizzas and the value that's being delivered um, is, is highly uh, dis disjointed. It's dysfunctional today. And I know that sounds crazy, but um, the, the model has, has been over the past decade, uh, whether you reside in Las Vegas or whether you, you like uh, New York style pizza, Chicago pizza, it's, it's all about uh, the ingredients that are on the pizza. And the pricing is uh, set as such that uh, we're going to charge you, you know, for a slice of pizza. Uh, if you walk in a la carte, it's a convenience purchase. Uh, and, and one of the most interesting things I want to reveal to the audience is that these organizations are leaving money on the table. And, and why are they leaving money on the table? Because it's, in theory, there's two approaches to pricing a pizza. You can price it on an a la carte basis uh, where you price for every ingredient that goes on that pizza. Uh, you can also price by the size of the pizza, small, medium, or large. Uh, you can price uh, alternatively, uh, and that's the way the model has been for the last couple of years or last decade. And I believe that organizations um, who follow this type of approach um, are not capturing the true essence of, of sort of a demand-based approach to pricing. So if you look at it from a demand-based approach, it's actually all about the popularity. It's a popularity contest. Mark revealed his own true nature of what he likes most on this call. And, and that's very important to know, because if we find enough individuals like Mark, who like a lot of meat, uh, we can then determine how popular that pizza is in the marketplace and price accordingly. And if, if a meat-based pizza, or in this case, if a pepperoni-based pizza uh, is deemed to be the most popular pizza in that market or in your market, then my belief is we should reverse how pricing is uh, communicated to the customer and we should actually uh, charge a premium for that rather than a discount. And you'll find if you look at any uh, pizza menu uh, that a cheese pizza or a pepperoni pizza tends to be less expensive than one with other types of ingredients on it, whether it's a Hawaiian pizza, pineapple and bacon or a sausage pizza. The theory's always been that, uh, or the perception has been that customers uh, have a preference uh, or they perceive those ingredients to be more gourmet and therefore the uh, vendor's gonna charge more for it. Um, that okay. is so hang on. true. Hang on, I gotta push back a little bit. Sure, Mark. So, so I got two pushbacks for you. The first one, I'm gonna give you why pepperoni pizza costs more than cheese pizza because it costs more to make it. Now, you and I both know that pricing should not be driven by costs, but our, right. customers, our customers don't know that. And so when they look at a pizza that's got just cheese and no pepperoni on it, they say, well, shouldn't that be less expensive than a pepperoni pizza? And they think they're getting ripped off if you charge them more. What do you think of that amazing theory? I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's probably, uh... The perception is probably true. You're, you're correct about that. And, and you and I, having been in this business long enough, will definitely agree that pricing, uh, I think we can commonly agree that pricing is not about cost. Uh, and, and to be frank, uh, uh, there's a percentage of the audience or the customer base that probably will focus on the cost elements and, and, and ask the very question to the vendor, well, why are you charging me more for a pizza that has less? In other words, less is more. And I, I think the challenge is with, with pizza vendors, as well as most organizations, whether you're in, in the pizza vertical, industry vertical, or whether you're manufacturing uh, a complicated, heavy-duty piece of equipment and selling it with all its features, the key is to really figure out how to move away and make price a little less transparent and focus on the value and the demand of those products. It's all about supply and demand. Uh, the stock market reflects that very well, um, as does Bitcoin. Uh, we, we don't know the intrinsic value of some of these items, and we're not interested in the cost. All we're interested in is the supply and the demand of those very particular products. And to that end, what, what we can do, or what I would recommend to your audience, 
is to, is to get away from breaking it out into sort of this good, better, best pricing approach and, and really either harmonize uh, the, the pricing practices by uh, joining the two prices, cheese pizza and pepperoni pie, uh, pizza price together. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a differentiation um, of 40 or 50 cents a slice between a, a typical cheese pizza and a pepperoni pizza. It bring the lower price up to the medium price. Uh, and then all the additional uh, pizza slices or pizzas with all the other additional ingredients, those are perhaps maybe a higher price point. And so we, we consolidate from perhaps three segments, three product categories to two product categories. Your high demand, um, well-received product offerings that are probably, it's probably a Pareto's principle, 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of all sales are from cheese pizza and pepperoni slices. And the other 20% are gourmet upscale slices. And to that end, the key is now not to figure out what to do with the uh, cheese pizza slice or the pepperoni pizza, but really how to figure out um, how to price the gourmet slice, which is now becoming the anchor price, the price by which the customer will decide whether it's a niche product and they're willing to pay for that gourmet experience. Yeah, my mind is going in a whole bunch of different places here because there's always so many lessons you can learn when you think about these. So if we're going to use a gourmet slice as an anchor, what we're really saying is when somebody comes in, uh, somebody might be willing to pay what uh, the sheet that we're looking at, we just happen to have some pizza slice prices on it, uh, says uh, cheese for $4.29, pepperoni for $4.69, topped for $5.09. I don't even know what topped means, but that's okay. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if I were to sell a gourmet slice for $7, then I've got some people walking in the door who are willing to pay me seven bucks for a piece of, for a slice of pizza. That's right. got these gourmet toppings and I'm capturing more from my customers from my marketplace. So that's really nice. And at the same time, I'm using my high demand products to bring more and more people in and keep the, the business flowing. I think is one of the, the challenges, challenge? Mark, is, um, uh, you know, how, how do we uh, avoid price transparency? And, the, and this theory holds true to most businesses. How do you avoid price transparency? And, and the most common and transparent prices that will likely be compared is the cheese pizza and the pepperoni slice. And so if you're a vendor and you have a bunch of competitors uh, on the same block or around the block, the consumer is very good or the customer is very good at, at, at referencing and comparing the most basics of any offering. But when it gets more complex, it becomes increasingly more difficult. Therefore, it's hard to compare a gourmet pizza, even if it's at $7 a slice, uh, because it's very difficult to understand what was it the nature and quality of the, of the protein of the, of the chicken or the beef that was put on that slice of pizza. And so if we can avoid price transparency, uh, in industry, in the pizza world, uh, by um, changing the, the, the nature of how the game is played for a, cheese, a slice of cheese or a pepperoni, um, then all of a sudden we, we, take, uh, we, we become less, less focused on price, more focused on the quality of the product. You know, some will argue, of course, that if you, if you harmonize the two different prices between a cheese and pepperoni pizza and you bring the lowest common denominator, the, the very basic cheese pizza, up to the pepperoni slice, then uh, not only have you recaptured some additional incremental revenue that you didn't have in the past, and, but at the same time, you're now asking the customer uh, to focus more on the value. And, and some would argue there's a lot of studies that have been put out there that when you get below $10 on a price point uh, in this type of industry, the perception is that it's likely a better quality product anyhow. Price dictates value. And if you can combine some and, and provide a more simplistic menu, uh, the, it's easier for the consumer uh, to evaluate. Uh, they don't get lost and, and you don't get into a pricing game where you're sort of asking customers to trade off the cost of products by having different price points between cheese, pepperoni and all the others. The, you are uh, forcing the customer to acknowledge that, oh, uh, pepperoni slices must be more, must must be a higher cost product. Therefore, that's a rationalization for, for a price increase. So, so explain to me 
what you mean when you say we're trying to avoid price transparency. Because, I mean, I think there are times where we want to avoid tra price transparency, and there are other times where we don't want to avoid it, where we want to make it easy for people to make decisions. So, so well, what is it that you're thinking when you say that? I, I, what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, we always talk about um, in Ma what I call Mazda. What is your meaningful and sustainable differential advantage? How do you get away from being the same as your competitor? And if you can adjust your menu and only have a couple of price points, then all right away, you're different than your competitor, who's probably still charging different prices for a, a regular slice of a cheese pizza slice and a pepperoni slice. If, if you and I went into 10 different uh, restaurant, pizza restaurants, we'd probably see the same setup on the menu board. It would show, you know, margarita, plain cheese pizza, followed by pepperoni pizza, followed by all the gourmet pizzas and all the different price points. And it makes it much easier for a customer to go store hopping, uh, become less loyal because they're always trading off between the slice at one place and the price. And they can easily compare one price point and one type of pizza slice with the other store's uh, price point and pizza slice. So the idea is really to harmonize it or, or to uh, combine some of these, these uh, products, uh, come up with one price. And then there's very, it's hard to know why are you charging that price? Is it really more to leaning towards the pepperoni pizza or more towards the cheese pizza? Uh, but let me introduce one more thing to this whole equation because it's really about moving customers to where you want them to end up at the end of the day. And it's incumbent upon vendors to drive purchasing behavior, not the other way around. You know, consumers have become too strong and same with customers have become very strong uh, given the, the amount and the plethora of communication information that is easily accessible online uh, or through friends or through other businesses and so on. And so the goal is really to focus less on price and price points, focus more on, on value and, and, and increasing that value perception and differentiation through time. And so I'm introducing the concept because we really don't want individuals coming in, in this example, and ordering just a slice of pizza. We want people moving towards the bundle at the end of the day, as, as does McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and all the big, the, the big Q, QSRs out there, quick service restaurants. And it's a, so um, you, you have not, if you're not forcing the customer to move to a, a, a better value proposition, you're, you're not getting your full share of wallet. The customer comes in the store, you already have a captive audience and you should essentially uh, provide as, as much value as you can deliver to that customer at, at, at a reasonably fair price. So if we then move away from this vertical pricing approach on a, on a pizza slice and having different price points and try to transition horizontally from pizza slices to bundles, then we can move, transition the customer now to purchase more than they otherwise would have purchased and, and, and start selling secondary and tertiary items like a Coca-Cola, okay, so, like a cheese so bread. I, I want to, uh, I'm going to do the math using the board that, that Michael and I are looking at. And by the way, I'll put this in the show notes so you guys can all see it. But a slice of cheese pizza is $4.29. A slice of pepperoni pizza is $4.69. That's a 40 cent difference. Most restaurants have in the around a 25% food cost uh, based on their, their pricing. And so that implies that the pepperoni they think costs them probably in the ballpark of 10 cents. So what Michael is saying is, what if we didn't charge 469? What if we only charge 429? We said pepperoni is the exact same price as cheese. We bring more people into our restaurant. Nobody eats a pepperoni pizza without having a soda. And if you pay $1.89 for soda, that actually costs them in the ballpark of 15 cents. So we just brought in more people, sold more soda because we gave up 10 cents on a pepperoni pizza. That's not a bad decision. No, that's a pretty good decision. I mean, you know, as you and I both know in the, in the pricing world, the, the, the important uh, component of understanding price is also to, to um, evaluate and determine the elasticity of demand. So we, we clearly need to know um, by dropping price for the pepperoni slice or elevating price for the, the margarita or cheese uh, slice, what kind of impact will that have on market share? Um, if it's not significant, then 
uh, and we don't have a, um, and we have some volume lift by dropping price on the pepperoni, and it offsets Mark's uh, common, you know, uh, costing approach uh, that he's introduced. Then, then it, it might make sense. It, it's a better value proposition. Uh, I'm more inclined to actually move up the price of the cheese pizza to 4.69, bring it in line with the pepperoni, uh, capture 40 additional cents per slice because a slice of pizza is what we call a, a convenience purchase. C customers are highly inelastic and we just chose one of the most popular pizza slices in the market. And I don't think too many people are gonna notice so long, and, and the caveat being so long that we offer bundles, combinations as the menu board is suggesting. If we can offset any of these price adjustments with some really favorable bundles, we incrementally will make more money uh, by selling ancillary products uh, like the salad that's shown in this menu board or a bowl of spaghetti, a little bowl of spaghetti or a Pepsi or Coca-Cola. Uh, not only will we increase our incremental revenue, may not increase our margin, but we'll increase incremental revenue. Uh, and in a way, you can also use the bundle as an anchor price as well by making the, the single uh, slice seem less expensive, but, but somewhat reasonable, even though we've increased uh, the cheese slice and brought it in line. Uh, with the uh, pizza slice. Okay, so so I want to defend my theory for a second, and you're welcome to defend yours too. That's okay, but I want to define my theory in the sense that companies often have loss leaders, and if my customers happen to know, oh, this is the price of a, a slice of cheese pizza, I should expect to pay this price. Uh, for example, McDonald's, at least they used to, charge ninety nine cents for a double cheeseburger. Right? And they lost money on every double cheeseburger they sold, but they did that because they could sell sodas and fries with their double cheeseburgers. And, and I would almost argue that people who buy slices of pizza, by the way, that's not me. If I'm going to buy pizza, it's a whole thing. So I have leftovers <laughs> in the fridge, right? <laughs> but if, You're a true American, someone's... Mark. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if somebody's going to buy a slice of pizza, I would guess it's something they do regularly and they actually know what the price is or they would expect to pay for a slice of pizza, whether it's cheese or pepperoni or, or whatever their favorite slice is. I think uh, I'll challenge that. I, I believe at this price point, most people have no idea what the price of a pizza slice is unless one of their friends tells them. In other words, they said, did you try this pizza down the street? Not only is it fantastic, it's 25 cents cheaper and, and it's a great value proposition. But, but otherwise, I, I, I'm not convinced that most people have an idea. You know, we've, uh, I, I don't like plugging our firm, but over the years, you know, SPMG has worked for uh, chicken restaurants and burger restaurants like McDonald's um, in various parts of the world. And one of the things that people, most consumers actually don't know, the typically don't know the individual price of a product. What they do know is how much they're willing to spend when they go out. And, and, and so they know they just want to spend 10 or $15 for lunch, or if they go for dinner, they, want to, they, they know how much they want to spend on their family. So they, they've established a budget. And it's all about the budget, you know, how much, if I'm alone and I'm, I'm running out for lunch on an individual basis, I just want to spend perhaps 10 or $15. If I'm with my family, I only want to spend $50, um, you know, going for a slice of pizza. But on an individual basis, the average individual really, really doesn't know uh, whether last week was 429 and now it went to 449. Um, uh, especially yep. when you incorporate the tax component over, overlaying on that. Yes. So let me agree with you in that if I went out for a slice of pizza, I have absolutely no idea what it should cost because I would never, I never buy a slice of pizza someplace. So you're absolutely <laughs> right. To me, it's, is it in my budget? Does it seem reasonable? On the other hand, when I picture people who buy slices of pizza, I always picture, um, you see Berkeley, you walk down College Avenue, there's seven pizza places in a row. And I can imagine those students know exactly which pizza place they want to go to and what the price is of that slice of pizza. Right. And, and so to me, it's, you know, the thing I love about what we're talking about is we can go test it. It's easy to test this stuff. I think one of the, so you raise a great point. Of course, you're, you know, we just identified the, the most elastic market in, in, in the world, which is students, student population with zero income. Uh, <laughs> see, you threw a curveball at me there, Mark. But <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, let, let's assume that most of the pizza chains are all over the place and and <laughs> and selling into commercial markets and business people as well. But but all all joking aside, um, the goal in business as and and this is why I wanted to bring the pizza concept because it's 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 something that resonates with everyone and most people can relate to a pizza or a pizza slice. And, and the rules hold true whether you're selling pizza or, uh, again or whether you're selling, uh, you know, automation equipment uh, for Schneider. <laughs> it, it's, it, it, you have to, if you have a captive audience, the, the customer is, has either, is either loyal or they're relatively new and they haven't earned the benefit of getting discounts. And I know that seems harsh and tough uh, to our audience here, but the customer should pay the price set on the menu for at least the first slice or the first pizza pie. Now, what the organization should do, and, and they typically do this in college towns uh, like Ohio State, uh, <laughs> I'll Buckeyes. mention that, um, <laughs> is, is, is you, you would, one would offer the second slice perhaps for half price. And so the loyalty is earned after the first purchase um, and therefore, the the customer has now sh uh, reflected or shown the the vendor that I, I'm indeed willing to purchase a little bit more. And how you know, and asking really asking the question, how are you going to reward me for that? If you'll find that a lot of pizza shops, unfortunately, when you ask for a second slice, they 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 quote you 4.29 again, just like on this menu board. There's no discount, and there's no effort to build any sort of loyalty. Which, which brings me home to your, your book that you just wrote, you know, Win, Keep, Grow. I mean, companies are pretty good at winning some business. Uh, they're less good at keeping them and, and even worse at growing the business. Uh, they, companies focus on new customers rather than finding ways to reward your existing client base um, in some manner. And in the, I think in the pizza business, uh, instead of always focusing on the bottom line, which you're eroding when you give a discount, uh, you, as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, better to sell the first slice at full price, full ticket price, the second slice at half price, you're more than covering your costs and, and also covering some, some uh, incremental fixed overhead at, at the same yeah. time and an extra sales and extra sale. Nice. Michael, now I have to invite you back because you plugged my book. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we are, uh, we are running out of time, but I do want to end with the final question, and you have to tie it back to pizza. Um, what's the one piece of pricing advice you'd give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Uh, I, I think the biggest piece of advice would be definitely focus um, on, on demand, supply and demand issues. When, when something uh, seems very busy, um, there's, there's tremendous opportunity to elevate your price uh, so long as you're delivering value. Uh, in the marketplace. Uh, the caveat being that you, you don't want to get into an overcharging or ripoff strategy, but if the customer acknowledges that uh, the value exists and they're willing to pay for it, then don't, don't hold back. Um, you know, grow, grow your incremental revenue even organically and, 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 uh, and make sure that you avoid price transparency. Focus on value delivery. And so if I could repeat what you just said, I think what you said was, your highest volume products are places you should go look for opportunities to raise prices. Yes, I think so. That's correct. Awesome. That's a great, great piece of advice. Michael, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, they can uh, contact me by sending me an email. M Hurwich, H-U-R-W-I-C-H at S-P-M-G and then global, G-L-O-B-A-L.com. And yes, there are two Gs in my email, SPMG Global. Okay, and uh, that'll probably be in the show notes as well as your uh, link to your LinkedIn page would be my guess. Um, all right, episode 126 is all done. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And if you have any questions or comments about this podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, Mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. <laughs>